What movie or series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? That's a hard one. <laughs> I love movies, man. I watch so many movies. Uh, I think, you know, when I was growing up, I used to watch movies with my grandmother and, you know, my father. And she loved old gangster movies, my grandma. So I remember watching White Heat with uh, James Cagney. And I was just blown away about how gangster the mom was. And I haven't seen that before, you know. Uh, when I saw Corsaro's film, Seven Samurai, that took me to a, a place I've never been before. Because, you know, growing up as a kid, we watched Godzilla and was it Mighty Joe Young, all the karate films, Fist of Fury. I think the one that really grabbed me was Deer Hunter because it was shot in Pittsburgh, which is where I'm from. And Deer Hunter just kind of reminded me of a place I knew and people I, I knew uh, in my life. Uh, the Vietnam War, you know, which uh, I had family members there, obviously, my father, my uncle. And I was watching these steel mills get shut down and everything and people being lost and sort of lost innocence. Um, but then seeing the visuals, the cinematic visuals of being in Vietnam and uh, the beauty and the hardship of it all was just blew my mind. And the brotherhood and the, the relationship and friendship, uh, I, I knew that world, like it, it hit me in a deep place. Apocalypse Now just blew my mind. But to this day, I, I still, I don't know how Francis Ford Coppola pulled that off. I know we've seen documentaries and books. It's still mind boggling the sheer um, coordination of it all. The helicopters, the, you know, the battle scenes, they were just so well executed within chaos that it felt like a, a docudrama almost. Like, uh, and cinematically, it was just, um, it was nothing I ever saw before. It was so beautiful. Like you couldn't turn away from it, even though it was some ugly things happening. I couldn't turn away from it. And I remember wanting to be able to uh, paint pictures that way or tell those stories. Um, the performances were so raw. I, I had a chance to talk to Larry Fishburne about his experience there. And I think he was 15 in the middle of the jungle, yeah? And there was a scene where his mother sent him a tape. I think it was a, it, no, it was a, it was a letter. And they were, and you heard her voice as he read it. And that was really Larry's mom. It was, so I remember feeling it was so raw and so real. And then, you, you know, and later I found out that because it was, it was a letter from his mom. There's something about that film, even Deer Hunter as well, that you can see the rawness in it. You can see in Deer Hunter, you can see De Niro and Christopher Walken and those actors in Meryl Streep. You can see what they brought to it, the, the, the humanity and dignity and the, the pain that the actors brought to the table. And when I did Training Day, Apocalypse Now was sort of my um, beacon. And the car was the boat. And the idea of going upriver was through South Central, uh, you know, uh, Compton and South Central into uh, the jungle. So for me, that film and the sun rising in the beginning of the movie, because Apocalypse Now was always sort of in my heart as a film. And, uh, you know, every filmmaker wants to make a film like the ones we admire. I don't know if I ever make a film as great as that film, but I aspire to, you know, that film is sort of up here and I'm trying to get there. On your way up, what movie or series did you watch that was so good it made you question if you could ever rise to that level? Uh, a lot of them. Godfather, for one. You watch that movie and you go, well, why bother? I mean, it's just so good, you know. You just got I don't know, you know. And, and then I got to be honest, I remember um, when Oliver Stone did uh, Platoon, those sort of films from those filmmakers, they were so epic and the performances were so, I'll tell you a film to this day that I think is maybe uh, doesn't get as much credit as it should. And I know I'm talking about a lot of war movies, but eventually I mean, that's kind of what I loved. When I saw Heaven and Earth, I mean, Tommy Lee Jones was just incredible. He was just incredible. And those films, I remember watching those movies and I, and I thought, I'm not sure if uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I should continue on. <laughs> Do I really want to do this? <laughs> I think you have to go out there on a limb. You know, I don't, I don't know how you're going to ever be able to make a great film. I mean, Citizen Kane, you know, you got to just go out there on a limb, break some rules, 
like you said, fall on your own sword, uh, have a vision, hopefully. Um, but you can't go into it thinking, I don't think you can go into it thinking I'm gonna make the greatest film ever made. I think you have to go into it going, I'm gonna make the best film I can possibly make with every resource I have, with the material I have. Whether it was your own work or approval from someone who mattered to you, what first gave you the confidence that you belonged? Uh, Denzel, you know, I, I, Denzel and Ethan. I think the, the first scene I did was them sitting in the booth and I was obviously nervous, you know, working with Denzel and, and, uh, and someone even like Ethan on his level. And after the take, I was happy when I got the takes I wanted. And I remember going to Denzel and Ethan and I said, hey, um, you guys want to come to the monitor and see, you know, because I'm ready to move on. And I'll never forget Denzel said, man, you flying this ship. I'm going to my trailer. Call me when you need me and walked away. And not one time has he ever come over to my monitor to check and see what I'm doing or to ask me, let me do another, let me do another one. I didn't like that one. If I said I wanted to move on nine times out of 10, he was like, you got it? You good? Okay, great. Walked away, which obviously put pressure on me thinking I better not screw this. You know what I mean? My house thinking, oh shit. And the same thing with Ethan. And I think it was because they had my back that way. Uh, that's kind of what gave me the confidence that, uh, I can do this. When Denzel works with you again and again, that's sort of the, that's the pat on the back that, 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 that's important. When Ethan Hawke works with you again and again, I think I did three with Ethan, that's the pat on the back. Uh, so I think that's the biggest compliment a director can get, you know, when working with great actors is when they come back to work with you again, when they trust you enough to do it again. What was the biggest obstacle you overcame that allowed you to turn the projects that influenced you into your own language? The obstacles? Uh, you know, I think being black was an issue early on back then. Uh, when I started doing music videos, I remember there was a time where some filmmakers, but they would get videos for let's say a million dollars or half a million dollars with some of the big rock groups or other people. And at the time they didn't give R&B or rap much money. I had to find a way to get color out of it. Just take color away because I would want to work with Sting or work with, you know, some of the rock groups as well. But I couldn't because, you know, they just kind of looked at me as an R&B or rap guy. And I got to work with some great artists. I loved it. I worked, you know, Heavy D and Prince and all these guys. Uh, but I wanted to mix it up as well. So I just stopped and started doing commercials for like Giorgio Armani and, you know, Nike and all these other commercials. So that allowed me to take away the color because commercials, there's no color. I worked with Pirelli in Italy, you know, and then when I would get offered films, a lot of them were just uh, very urban based films, you know, uh, uh, The Hood, which I, I could do that with my eyes closed. I know those stories, but you know, I grew up watching movies that were uh, sprawling and epic. And I wanted to tell stories about other things, King Arthur or whatever. I felt at least I had to constantly remind people that I was a filmmaker and, and not a black filmmaker, just because when they said that back then, it was a negative thing. It was almost like, oh, he's a black filmmaker. And I saw always say, well, is Scorsese, is he an Italian filmmaker? You know, they didn't put that title on other people. Is he an Irish filmmaker? He's just a filmmaker. So I had to overcome that, I believe, uh, in this business. What keeps you optimistic that this industry will be able to rebound? Well, I've been editing my film on Infinite. Uh, so I've been focused on that uh, remotely, of course. So I've been professionally doing that, but I've also been doing documentaries. I'm doing one with Chris Paul about the day sports stood still, and Brian Grazer. I'm doing one of the, about the Lakers uh, with Jeannie Buss, about their whole epic story. Um, so I've been you know, staying busy because I think that's part of what we do in our business is we stay busy, we try to find a way. I think filmmakers have always found a way. Even during war times, filmmakers went there and filmed the war. You know, we'll find a way. Today, the technology sort of allows you to uh, find a way, to find a way. I mean, I tell young filmmakers sometimes, grab your digital, grab your phone. iPhones are pretty good these days. You know, go get yourself a little Leica and just start capturing some stories, just tell some stories. 
you know, and edit it together. They don't have to be an hour or two hours. They could be 30 minutes. They could be five minutes. We'll find a way. <laughs>